this is Lady Boulay, and I hope you're having a great day. Thank you for your support. Thank you for subscribing to the channel. Thank you for your thumbs up, for your comments, and thank you for sharing the videos. Thank you for all you do to support the channel. And yes, we are commanded to love one another, whether we want to or not, or whether we agree with each other or not. Now lately, we've been hearing about how we are playing the victim. We want reparations. We're playing the victim. We want an anti-black crime bill. We're playing the victim. Even though the FBI says that black Americans are the main victims of hate crimes in America. We want something done about mass incarcerating black men for nonviolent crimes. Oh, oh, we need to stop playing the victim. Although these men are going to jail for years for things that white men get a slap on the wrist and go home and get a good night's rest. We want fair employment and fair pay for jobs that we are qualified for. They tell us that we need to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps and then they attack diversity, equity, and inclusion and pass a law saying that you cannot practice diversity, equity, and inclusion. And then every time a black person gets a job that they want, they call the black person the DEI hire. They're afraid to compete on an even playing field. Something's got to be weighted in their favor at all times. But we're the ones playing the victim. So at some point you have to realize something is wrong with this picture. And the picture is that maybe we're not the ones playing the victim. This headline caught my eye from the Weekly Conversation podcast. And it says, Trump tapped into white victimhood, leaving fertile ground for white supremacists. Now this publication is a global publication that talks about issues all over the world and the South is multicultural, but a white person wrote this article. So I want to share this and we need to determine who's really playing the victim. I'm sure you recognize this picture of young men on the screen. This happened in Charlottesville, Virginia in 2017, where they were demonstrating against DEI with their tiki torches, screaming, you will not replace us. You will not replace us. And I think they were saying Jews will not replace us. But this is the Trump crowd screaming about somebody trying to replace them. Now, who's playing the victim? Despite failed lawsuits, recounts, and former confirmation that President-elect Joe Biden won the 2020 presidential election, President Donald Trump and his supporters continue to maintain that the election was rigged and that he and the American people are victims of massive voter fraud. You'll notice that word, victim. I'm not sure when this article was written. Well, it was written in about 2017 or 18. But it says, this politicization of victimhood is nothing new to the Trump presidency. And we know that. Anytime something doesn't go his way, anytime he loses, somebody cheated or it wasn't fair, he plays the victim all the time and they don't even recognize it. It was there from the beginning. When Trump descended the escalator in Trump Tower to announce his presidential campaign in 2015, he stoked fears of Mexican rapists and drug traffickers attacking U.S. citizens. The claims of victimhood ran throughout his presidency. He played on U.S. fears of being attacked by foreign terrorists to enact the travel ban targeting several Muslim-majority countries. When protesters called for the removal of Confederate monuments, Trump claimed that they wanted to make people ashamed of American history. As COVID-19 spread across the United States, Trump dubbed it the China virus and contended that China would pay for what it had done. And instead of the Chinese standing up to Trump and calling him a bald-faced lie, they blamed it on the Africans. But anyway, back to the article. Journalists and commentators also turned to a sense of aggrievement 
to explain the popular support Trump received. A narrative emerged. White working class voters from rural and rust belt communities felt abandoned by the political establishment. Well, didn't everybody? Anyway, decades of free trade, automation, and cuts to the social safety net turned these voters against the mainstreams of both political parties. But this narrative fails to answer two critical questions. Why did upper middle class and wealthy white voters who weren't economic victims vociferously support Trump in 2016? And why do communities of color who've experienced centuries of economic and racial victimization largely oppose him? Okay, now let's stop and think in case you missed that. Trump is telling these white people that they've been victimized in some way. But they supported him because they've been victims. Yet, the people who've been the most victims, black Americans, are against him. They are black people opposed to him. So the question is, if Americans are being victimized, why are the Americans who have had the most privilege supporting them and the Americans who've had the least amount of privilege, who've been victimized for centuries, against him? That's the question. Because it's not about being victims. It's about privilege, people wanting privilege, and it's about white supremacy. That's what it's about. That's how come the people who've actually been victimized opposed to him. The person that wrote this article is a professor at Arizona State University, and he says, I teach about whiteness in the United States and am writing a book on the rhetoric of white entrenchment. I believe Trump and Trumpism tapped into a long-standing sense of agreement that often, but not exclusively, manifests as white victimhood. Yeah, yeah. White victimhood is nothing but people wanting privilege and continued privilege, and they don't want anybody else to have any privilege. It's really not that complicated. The politics of white victimhood is nothing new. No, it's really not. For example, before the Civil War, pro-slavery advocates blamed abolitionists for causing slave revolts and endangering the lives of white Southerners. So see, in that the plan the victim, people want to be free and they're blaming it on people outside of the South and saying those people are endangering the lives of the white people in the South. Figures like Lou Dobbs and Pat Buchanan have alluded to plots involving Mexican immigrants and the Mexican government to retake the U.S. Southwest. And that's why they're afraid of black people. When you do somebody wrong, you're always looking over your shoulder thinking that they are going to do something wrong back to you. This paranoid victimhood ultimately led to a ban on ethnic studies in some Arizona schools after politicians claimed that the classes encouraged hatred toward white people and activists contended that Mexican-American studies would bring about a reconquest of the U.S. Southwest. Now, does that sound familiar? That's how come they also don't want black American studies taught in schools. And there is the perennial war on Christmas, wherein some Christians feel they are persecuted by people who say happy holidays to recognize that their fellow citizens may celebrate other faith traditions. Notably, the idea of a war on Christian was coined by Peter Brimlow, founder of the V. Dare White Supremacist website. See, <laughs> all of this stuff is starting to make sense. Even avowed white supremacists fear their victimhood and use fear of becoming the victim as a recruiting tool. So everybody says it's fear, but we never knew what they were afraid of. Well, now we know. They're afraid of becoming victims. 
They're afraid of not being able to take advantage of other people and having white privilege taken away from them. Okay, so they're afraid of being treated like they've treated other people. Okay, it's starting to make sense. Consider this motto widely used across various neo-Nazi groups. We must secure the existence of our people and a future for white children. These adherents would need to secure a future for white children if they didn't see that future as being endangered. And they're right about that because really, you read what you saw. Similarly, at the 2017 Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, Virginia, white supremacists chanted, Jews will not replace us. And let us never forget that a young lady lost her life over nothing really. Trump's stoking of victimhood is neither novel nor something that merely taps into economic anxiety. To understand whiteness, it is invested in victimhood. So we must explore whiteness. Historian David Roger demonstrated how in the 19th and 20th centuries, adopting whiteness gave working class European Americans certain psychological and social advantages as well as economic ones. American intellectual W.E.B. Du Bois, our ancestor, called these advantages the wages of whiteness. These wages of whiteness gave white Americans the social advantages afforded by higher paying jobs as well as residential and school segregation. The psychological payout came in knowing that even if they were being economically exploited by white elites, at least they held social standing above their black working class counterparts. And we already know this, that white skin carries them way beyond blackness even when they don't have anything. Although the United States is far from achieving racial equality, many of the former mechanisms for these wages have disappeared. We live in hyper-segregated neighborhoods, but racist housing covenants are now illegal. Now, in the 2025 project, they want to make housing discrimination legal again. Public education is tremendously unequal and often de facto segregated, but black or Mexican schools are no longer explicitly written into law like they used to be. But because whiteness is an identity built upon securing advantages over others, the historical shift toward greater equality, even if it's more formal than substantive, is perceived by many whites as a loss. American sociologist Michael Kimmel has described this as a form of aggrieved entitlement. In other words, the fact that your child has a right to go to the school that their children go to is offensive to them. And we already know that. For example, programs designed to address centuries of inequality and admit more students of color to universities were viewed by some white people as victimizing whites. In other words, they are being victimized just because you can get into the University of Georgia with test scores and everything else. Still, they're the victim because you took a slot that they weren't even qualified for. The danger isn't simply a victim identity. It's how victimhood can be deployed and weaponized. White power groups use this sense of victimhood to recruit and radicalize. In its most dangerous manifestation, the rhetoric of victimhood is used to excuse violence or rationalize murder. That's evident in the cases of mass killers, Elliot Rogers, Dylan Roof, or even Timothy McVeigh and the Oklahoma City bombing. Church shooter Dylan Roof invoked his victimhood when he claimed that what I did is so minuscule to what they are doing to white people every day, all the time. See, that's, that's sick. 
But anyway, y'all, this is what this article is saying that Donald Trump really didn't start this white victimhood. It was there all the time. He just tapped into it. And a lot of what's in this article, we already knew. We already knew it had figured out just through common sense. But to have it written down and documented reinforces what we already know. Okay, y'all, thank you for listening. I didn't mean to go this long, but I got into the article and didn't want to stop. So anyway, thank you for listening. Have a good day.